But on the surface, you just look at it and think, why would you choose David? I mean, imagine if your life with all the juicy bits left in was written down. Awesome. (laughs) Okay, there's the good bits that you'd be like, yes, okay, that's great. Accomplishments, achieved this, studied here, went here, visited here, did this. Then there's the bad bits and you think, okay, cool, yep, you've got to put them in for a bit of context, understand. Struggled with this, found this pretty difficult. But the ugly bits, really? God, did you really have to (laughs) include them? With David's life, it's all there. The good, the bad and the ugly. Mate. And so we do, we ask, why would you choose David? And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul actually reminds us why God in fact chooses any person, really. (laughs) It says in 1 Corinthians 1 verses 26 to 29, brothers and sisters, and I think he's reminding us today, think of what you were you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. No one can boast in the presence of God that God picked them because they're awesome. How good is that? (laughs) God chose David and God chooses us just because he chooses us. And yet when you look at people to admire, you look at social media particularly, you look at people that we are impacted and swayed by, that we're impressed by, it's often the superficial things that we notice. We want to see the beautiful people. We want to see the brilliant people. We want the best and the brightest. And so I found some pretty hilarious pictures that show the expectation or what we want and the actual reality. Take a look at these. I mean, first of all, who puts their baby in a pumpkin? (laughs) Seriously. And then second of all, who expects their baby to like sit there all happy that they're sitting in a pumpkin, which would probably be quite sticky? Who would take the time to carve out holes in a pumpkin to stick their kid in a pumpkin? I mean, the reality is the right-hand side, surely. Can I hear an amen, Kate Bryce? (laughs) All right, next one. (laughs) There's this beautiful airbrush picture of this lady leaning into the flowers and she's got the... She's standing in a supermarket leaning into, like, the flowers with someone sticking some ferns in her face. I mean, seriously. The next one. Not that one, that's the end. (laughs) We like to think that, you know, maybe... Okay, let's clean up some messes, children. Let's learn it. Let's have this as a learning experience. It's going to be great. I'll get the broom and you get the brush and we'll clean it all up and it'll be wonderful. Reality, you usually walk into a mess where the kid, child has, your child or someone's, has dumped a massive amount of messy things on the ground, pulled out all the drawers, stomping around it, having a great time. Expectation, reality are different. <laughs> How about this? Mums have this picture sometimes before they have a baby that we're just going to have this awesome sleep and the baby's on me and it's great and then they wake up and the kid's poking them in the eye. (laughs) This made me laugh for hours, this one. Fatherhood, we think, yes, I'm going to look at this beautiful baby and then we wake up with a child standing on our face. (laughs) Unless that's really happened to you, you won't understand, but that's actually quite funny. (laughs) It's hilarious. It's like a kid standing there going, hi, and they're standing on the dad's face. Great, thank you, that's awesome. So the image we portray to the world isn't often reality. And God chooses people the world sees as nobodies and turns them into somebodies. Why? Well, just because he chooses them. In choosing David, in 1 Samuel 16, it says this, when they, Jesse and his sons, who Samuel had arrived to have a ceremonial worship of God, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, David's older brother, and thought, surely, 
the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I've rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at what? The heart. And so this verse got me thinking this week. I was thinking about what is it that when God looks at a heart that he wants to find? What is it that impresses him when he looks at a heart? What's he wanting to find there? And so I looked up the word heart in the NIV Bible and there's 725 references to heart. That's a lot of mentions. I didn't read all of them. But I read quite a few of them. And the theme that came through, the recurring theme, the theme that it really boils down to when you look at, if you could pick one word that described the essence of what God is looking for in a heart that is responsive to him, it is this, devotion. Devotion. Devotion implies wholehearted affection, wholehearted loyalty, passionate worship, reverence, faith, hope and trust. It speaks of doing what will bring him delight. It speaks of quickly responding to his voice and yielding our hearts to him again and again and again. And really a lifetime of devotion to God is a lifetime of yielding our hearts to him. Devotion is not something that is obvious in an instant. We can say we're devoted, but the true test of devotion usually comes over time. Feelings can ebb and flow, and devotion is mostly something that is proven over the long haul. Is there anyone here who's been married for 50 years plus? Can you stand up? Good on your Marin. Yep. Any more? Turn the lights up. Nah, it has to be 50 plus because I know 40 would get quite a few of you standing up. Keep standing. All right. We honour you and commend you and applaud you and esteem you for your devotion. That's a massive, massive win to make 50 years of marriage. Good on you. Why don't we put our hands together for them? And they're like, amen. (laughs) I think when the Lord looks at the hearts of those of us here who claim to follow Christ, those who have been rescued out of the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of his light, what he's looking for is devotion. Because devoted hearts are the ones that are in an intimate relationship with him. In 2 Chronicles 16, it says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Isn't that a beautiful verse? That's a word for some of you here. That's what you came to church to hear this morning. God's eyes have been ranging and looking and he's here this morning to strengthen you because you have not been perfect, but you're wanting to devote your life and you continually come back again to following in his ways. Praise the Lord. Here's another one. A teacher of the law heard Jesus talking with some other religious leaders and he came and asked of him, of all the commandments, which one's the most important? And Jesus responds, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your strength and with all of your soul. And the second is like it. He talks about loving others as we love him. And so this guy comes back and he says, Well said, teacher. The man replied, You're right in saying that God is, the, is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength and to love your neighbour as yourself is more important than burnt offerings, than going through the motions of religious ceremonies. <laughs> it's more important than sacrifice. I look around and I see the evidences of hearts and lives devoted to Jesus in this room. I see the fruit that's come from your life. By staying plugged in and connected to Jesus in vital relationship, by trusting him and obeying his voice. 
I see it. <laughs> Jean Zumas, you're a woman who has been devoted to Jesus. You've proven a life of faithfulness to the Lord. Be encouraged this morning. Why don't we put our hands together for Jean? You see the fruit of your life in your children and your grandchildren and the people that you're impacting for him? That's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's awesome. I could pick out so many of you this morning. What about the example of Pastor Bill and Kathy? This year we celebrate 40 years of them leading this church. 40 years. That's pretty massive. That's proving the faithfulness of God over the long haul. And I'm not saying he's done yet. Come on, bring on the next 40. But that's awesome. We're going to celebrate that at the end of this year. You think about the example of the Apostle Paul. He was devoted to Jesus under extreme persecution. And only the Holy Spirit can help you (laughs) with that. And in 1 Kings, we read about David. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. You know, one of David's legacies that he left as we look at his life is a legacy of devotion. It's one of the things that God commends him for. In Acts 13, 22, it says, After removing Saul, he made David their king, the Israelites. God testified concerning him. God testified concerning him. I found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. And so, yes, David messed up big time. My goodness. (laughs) I mean, he went and counted and numbered all the people and then to try and prove his own military strength instead of trusting in God. 70,000 people died because of that decision. That's crazy. We've talked about some of the other things that he did. But despite these deep flaws and sins, his heart desired to delight God. And that's what God commended him for. And so is that your heart's desire this morning, if you know him? Is that your heart's desire? It's mine. (laughs) And I keep coming back to it. And how can we tell? Do you know, we're really good at deceiving ourselves into thinking we're doing great. And so the Bible is like a mirror as we hold it up to our face. (laughs) How can we tell? Well, in Proverbs 27, 9, this is like a mic drop moment where I can just, this is all I could say, drop the mic and walk off, and you'd be like, whoa, God's speaking. As water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the heart. That's pretty convicting. (laughs) If you're a follower of Jesus, your life's responses show what's going on, what's going down in your heart. I'm not talking about stuff we can't control. There's crises that happen. There's physical illnesses that happen. There's other people's behaviour or hurtful things that happen. But we can choose how we respond and how we respond is always important. Even in times of struggle, we can do a devotion stock take. And that's what I felt like God wants us to do this week before Tuesday because we know that if you don't take action within two days of hearing a message, you probably won't do anything. Before this Tuesday, take a devotion stock take. Write down time. Write down money. Write down gifts and talents. Write down family. Write down the areas of your life that you have influence over and look at where are there areas of devotion where is God calling me to step and grow deeper into a life of devotion look at how you're sharing your faith look at spending time in the Lord and reading his word look at your church attendance and your attendance at small group are you just thinking yeah whatever or are you positioning yourself in in places where you're going to be encouraged to follow after Jesus regularly do a devotion stock take (laughs) No one's going to get a perfect 10, by the way, only Jesus. But we all need to be continually renewed in our devotion to him, day by day. (laughs) The second legacy of David's life is gratitude that I see. Gratitude, devotion, gratitude. 
David was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write 73 to 75 out of the 150 Psalms in the Bible. And the recurring theme that you get as you read them is gratitude. My soul will praise the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. I will extol Him. I will lift up my eyes. Gratitude. David's name means beloved. He knew that he was loved by God and cherished the fact that he was beloved by God, despite his many failings. So out of this gratitude of his heart, he wanted to live a life that loved God back, a whole life that loved him back. Do you know that you're loved by God? Do you know you were made to bring him pleasure, to say thanks with your life and love him back? Did you know that you're made to learn to love others like he does? Do you know despite all David had been through, as he approached the last years of his life, there was a song in his heart and praise on his lips. How good is that? I love being around people who are wise and mature in years and you sit with them and they're like, praise the Lord. They tell you about what he's done for them. They speak of his goodness instead of complaining. So good. As you get older each year, are there more reasons to complain or more reasons to give God praise? Pastor Barry Silverback, who's our international CRC's director, he came and spoke here at a church and we gave him the message topic. We asked him to speak on if I had one message to preach. And I was getting him to stand up and I was expecting him to stand up and preach this amazingly wise message from like, ex, you know, exposit the scripture, all this sort of stuff. And basically he stood up and he said, do you know what I would say? I would say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I mean, he's planted so many churches, has opened up nations, he's done all these amazing things out of his devotion and gratitude to God, but he would stand up and he would tell his salvation story and he would say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. How awesome is that? You're allowed to say amen, hallelujah, respond. I can see you're all taking it in, you're thinking about it. Go home and read David's prayer in 1 Chronicles 29. He's like, who am I and who is my family that you've been so kind to me? It's beautiful. Gratitude was a hallmark of David's life and it's part of the legacy that we get to enjoy through the spiritual benefits of the book of Psalms. Another legacy that David left was generational impact. Generational impact. (laughs) Some of his final words, it says that King David rose to his feet and said, Listen to me, my fellow Israelites, my people. I had it in my heart to build a house as a place of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord. A symbol of his presence where his power was to rest for the footstool of our God. And I made plans to build it. But God said to me, You are not to build a house for my name because you are a warrior and have shed blood. He said to me, Solomon, your son, is the one who will build my house and my courts. I mean, he had this dream, this desire in his heart to honour God's name, to build God a house. We know that God doesn't want to live in a house made by human hands. He wants to live in human hearts. But David had this noble honouring theme, this desire to build a place of worship and honour to God. And Charles Swindle captures what this moment must have been like so well. (laughs) Can you see Solomon as he stands there? Can you feel his heart pounding in his throat? He's inexperienced, untried, and there stands his battle-scarred father. After 40 record-making years as king, handing over the scepter of Israel and the plans for the temple of God. His bearded face was wrinkled with age, but those dark eyes were flashing with excitement. What a moment. David set up his son Solomon for success and he had generational impact that we are still talking about today. Even when God told David that the dream he'd held for so long was not in fact his to accomplish, he knew it was from God, but God said, no, I don't want you to actually do that. 
David didn't grumble and sit in his hands and throw a hissy fit and say, well, that's it. I'm out. He could have. Do you know what he did? He gathered every resource as much as he could, people and things, all the gold. He, he supplied all the, the, the materials for building of the temple. He amassed it all. He said, got it all, got the plans, got everything ready. And then he handed it over to Solomon and said, here you go. Do what God's called you to do. <laughs> Mate, this moves me so deeply. He chose to make all the necessary provisions to help the next generation who were going to come after him to achieve it. He unselfishly and lavishly provided resources and support to enable his son to outwork the purpose of God. When he could have actually sat on his hands and said, well, sort it out for yourself. What a beautiful heart that David had. Are you willing to set other people up for wins? Or do you just sit on your hands when you can't be in control of it? To be gracious and big-hearted and kingdom-minded enough that if God says no to you fulfilling a dream that's on your heart, that you know it's his will, that you will make room for and provide resources for and give sacrificially for for another to accomplish it. You don't care who gets the credit. You just want God's name to be honoured and lifted up. It starts with how we choose to speak of others. It starts with real opportunities we give others. It starts with how we let others take the credit. It starts with how we invite them to come with us and we cheer them on. It starts with our hearts. In Acts 13, verse 36, we read about David's generational impact. Now, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. That means he died, but he's going to live again in heaven. (laughs) Now, that is a legacy. Imagine that being written or said of you when you leave this earth. Phil Bryce served his generation. Served God's purpose, sorry, in his own generation. Vanessa Bartholomew served God's purpose in her own generation. I want that to be my legacy in some measure. (laughs) Whatever that looks like. I hope that that's a desire of your heart. And we say all this, the fact that he was... You know, he left uh, a leg- some legacies. He was devoted. He lived a devoted life. He was grateful. He had generational impact. Well, you might be thinking, well, how did he do it when he was just such a big sinner? <laughs> he was grace-reliant. David was grace-reliant. So many of the Psalms he wrote reveal that he was deeply aware of his very real need for God and his presence. In Psalm 16 verse 2 it says, I said to the Lord, you are my Lord, apart from you I have no good thing. Psalm 40 verse 1 to 3 says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and out of the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth. A hymn of praise to our God and many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. And that's us. He's talking about us. We see the Lord through the life of David. We put our trust in God because we see how grace reliant he was. It encourages us. When David saw his sin, when it was revealed to him that he'd been blinded and deceived by sin, he ran to God. He threw himself on God. (laughs) He was grace reliant. He had, God had showed him such undeserved favour in calling him, choosing him, sustaining his life, anointing him to be king, promising him a kingdom that would come from his family that would never end. David knew God's mercy was sheer gift. He couldn't earn it, but he could humbly receive it. Have a look at this psalm, Psalm 51. Just a few of the verses. A psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, 
according to your unfailing love. According to your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Create in me a clean heart, a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken, contrite heart you, God, will not despise. Has your heart ever been broken and contrite by your own wrong behaviour? Not sad because you got caught for doing the wrong thing, but deeply sorrowful for sin because it's displeasing to God. Where your pride and your self-sufficiency have been completely humbled by this consciousness of your guilt. There's genuine grief over hurting God and hurting others and a total reliance on God's help to make it right. That's what David experienced many times over. He was grace reliant. This is what I too have experienced in my own life, especially when I think of and I'm reminded of what it cost God to take away my sin. David didn't fully understand that. (laughs) But he looked ahead and prophesied, prophesied about the perfect king and anointed one who was to come, King Jesus. In Psalm 22, he composed a song, and these are some of the words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Do you know, this vivid is so descriptive, you would think that David was actually at the cross. He's talking about Jesus. He wrote these words around a thousand years before Christ was born. Jesus himself said those words on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David was aware that he deserved God's punishment. God's judgment for his sin. And yet he threw himself on God's mercy. He was grace reliant. Grace reliant. He didn't fully know what we know now, what we see now, but he was grace reliant. How about you? How about me? Are you increasingly in awe of what was accomplished by Jesus' death and resurrection on your behalf? Are you aware of your deep need for him, to, for him to be able to lead a life of devotion, gratitude and generational impact? We are grace reliant because it's a sheer gift of grace that we are in Christ Jesus. We can't earn it. We can only humbly receive what he's done for us on our behalf. When he took our sin on the cross, not his own. When he was punished for our wrongdoing, not his own. When he laid down his life and shed his blood for our sins, not his own. And when he was buried and now is risen from the dead and sends his beautiful Holy Spirit, his very presence to come and inhabit anyone who puts their trust in him. So they too can live a life of devotion, gratitude, generational impact. It's a wonderful legacy that before he could fully grasp what was, what was to come, David was grace-reliant. He continued to be. And it was through David's family that the Saviour came into the world. In Revelation 22, verse 16, I came across this because we read through Reno- Relevation, Relevation, Revelation when we did our life journal readings a little while ago. And I came across this verse and it blew me away. It's that Jesus says, I, Jesus... And both the source of David, I actually created David and called him and chose him and sustained him and had a plan for him in that unique time in history, but I'm also the heir to his throne. Solomon turned his heart away. He wasn't the the heir to the throne that God's kingdom, David's kingdom would last forever. Jesus is called the son of David. (laughs) 
David imperfectly devoted his heart and life to God. David's son Solomon turned away from devotion to God. But Jesus, the source of David and the rightful heir to his throne, perfectly obeyed. He was devoted and obedient to death, death on a cross. He demonstrated perfect devotion. And man, was he grateful. While he walked this earth, he was the perfect example of loving God with your whole life. And talk about generational impact. He secured our salvation forever and he has transformed the lives of millions and billions over the course of history. (laughs) His kingdom and his throne will never end. The throne of the son of David, as he's called, will never end. And how we need him, how we praise him, (laughs) how we live to make him known and tell of his works to the next generation. Can I hear an amen, church? Let's pray. You're sitting in God's presence right now. He's here by the power of his Holy Spirit. Do you want to live a life devoted to Jesus? He doesn't want all the stuff you can do for him. He actually just wants you unconditionally. Unconditional surrender. It's not a one-off event. We need to keep yielding to him. Where do you need to yield to him today? Maybe right now as you sit in your seat, it's the first time you've heard about a God that loves you and made a way possible for you to know him. And you need to get your life right with him. You need to invite him in and say, Jesus, I receive your forgiveness. You do that right now. Where is he asking you to take action? Do you want to live a grateful life? Humble yourself before God. Admit your need and your dependence on Him today. Do you want to have generational impact? Submit yourself and your dreams to God. What action do you need to take to obey Him today? Father, we're in your presence, a presence, your presence that is here that cost Jesus his very life. We bring our hearts to you. We don't keep them far from you. We bring them to you and we say, help us, oh God. (laughs) Help us, oh God, to live a life of devotion and gratitude and to have generational impact because we can't do it on our own. We need your help, Jesus. Just like David needed your help. Can we stand together?